Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Women's Equality, Cele Equality Day celebration in collaboration with the City of Clarkston and Hannah Joy TV. We are so thrilled to welcome everyone to this space, to this conversation, where we are going to be joined by four African-American women mayors from across Metro Atlanta and DeKalb County and Fulton County who are doing really great things in the community. Right now, we have two of those mayors here with us to kick things off, and that is, of course, Miss Mayor Beverly Burks from the city of Clarkston, and we also have Mayor Bianca Motley Broom as well joining us today, and that is from the city of College Park. Welcome, mayors. Thank you. Thank Happy you. to be here. Happy to be here, too. We're so happy that you all are here. And we know this is a very important day. It, um, of course, honors so much and it commemorates so much, including the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote in the United States. But it's not just about that. It's also about acknowledging equality and equity, as you can see on Mayor Motley Brooms' photo there. Uh, equity is very important. So we'd love to kick it off to you two first to introduce yourselves, um, to say hello to those who are joining us today from all around the country and even the world. Why don't we start with the mayor of Clarkston, Mayor Beverly Burks. Okay, well, thank you so much. And it is an honor for us to come together as female mayors to celebrate Women's Equality Day. I became mayor on my birthday, November 30th, 2020 in a special election. And doing so, I became the first woman of color and the first woman to serve as mayor for the city of Clarkston, the most diverse city per square mile with people from more than 50 different countries in our city. So again, for me, it is an honor to be here. It's an honor to have a message of empowerment for my community. And I look forward to a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much, Mayor Burks. And thank you for sharing this vision with us. Uh, you really brought us all together today. You put so much legwork into bringing us here. And so I just wanna thank you for your vision to really commemorate today's special occasion. And next we will hear from Mayor Bianca Motley Broom. Well, first I have to say what Mayor Burks did not include about herself is that she is running unopposed this year. Isn't that right? Yes, yes. yes. That's right. So congratulations <laughs> on that. Thank that you. is a that is a great accomplishment and thrilled to be able to work with you uh, in the years to come and look forward to all of your leadership uh, as, as we continue to proceed. Uh, I'm Bianca Motley Broom. I have been the mayor of College Park since January of 2020. Uh, I am the first person of color and the first woman to serve in that role and only the third elected female in our city's 125 year history. So uh, it is an honor to, to serve the community in this capacity. I am a, an attorney by training, which I share with my mentor who has joined us, uh, our, the illustrious mayor of East Point. Uh, and when I am not mayoring, I am, I am mediating. I'm not actively practicing as a lawyer, but uh, work to help people resolve their conflicts in a lot of different ways. And I think there's there's great carryover between mediation and, and my work in the community because it all takes an open mind and open heart and the ability to listen to people. So thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. And we are so happy that you two are here and soon we will hear an introduction from Mayor Dina Holiday Ingram. Uh, but again, we want to just take a moment to acknowledge that these two women that you just heard are the first, not just, um, you know, woman, but also African American women, uh, just a huge accomplishment to serve in those capacities. So we really just want to clap it up for both of you all for paving the way and really um, setting new, setting new milestones for our communities. Uh, so we'd like to now welcome Mayor Dina Holiday Ingram, who has joined the conversation from East Point. So we're so glad to have you here and welcome. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you this evening. I am Dina Holiday Ingram, mayor of the great city of East Point, where there's no point like East Point. And I am um, excited about this opportunity to share in this event talking about women equality. And so um, I moved to Georgia in 2010. So I've been here just a little over a decade and ran for office in 13, 2013 as a council member, um, was elected, served one term, and then ran for mayor. And I am the fourth woman to serve as mayor in the city of East Point. Um, the first black 
in the city of East Black mayor and the first female mayor was former mayor Patsy Jo Hilliard. And she was the first black female mayor in the state of Georgia. And so we have a lot of um, legacy and history in the city of East Point. She, her leadership, the impact that her leadership is still felt today. Um, so I stand on her shoulders and am honored to serve the great residents in the city of East Point. And so it has absolutely been a journey. I now have um, the mayor in my neighboring city as a friend and a mentee. Um, but we we go back and forth between mentor and mentee. It just depends on the conversation. But today you've been my mentor. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but awesome. Glad to be here. Congratulations again to Mayor Burks on running unopposed. That has to feel good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very good. And Even though I already bought all the signs, but. <laughs> right, hey. It's like, look, go ahead, put them out anyway. Go ahead. So, I promise you, like, if, if I had that, I would absolutely be like, oh, we'll figure out something with those signs. Don't worry about it. We'll put them up in um, But congratulations to you. And um, also on the work that you're doing, I think it speaks volumes um, that the residents want you to continue to serve them. And so that is an honor. Um, and I think it's a testament to your leadership. So congratulations. Thank you. And thank you, ladies, for participating in this program. You know, I, I, I've seen your work. My my sorority chapter is in East Point College Park. So I, I know your work quite well. So it, it makes total sense. Delta? No, no, no. <laughs> all the green oh, that I win. <laughs> it's yes. all love. So look, it's, it's all, all love. love. The whole divine eye, the divine eye <laughs> supports me. And yes, the days, um, in the East Point chapter, East Point College Park are absolutely um, partners and been there with me every step of the way. So yeah, I'm a handheld all the way as mayor. And I used to be the director, net executive director for the National Panhellenic Council. So yes, so. <laughs> There's just a lot of connections, a lot of connections here. And I mean, what an honor to bring all four of you here today together in some capacity um, in some form of representation. And we wanna, you know, go into some of these questions and and talk about your journeys a bit as well as offer some some guidance and advice to people who may be listening today and thanks to mayor burks uh she found this quote here and that is that kamala harris made history of course as the first woman and woman of color to be elected as u.s vice president and in a united nations gender equality speech harris said the status of women is the status of democracy i think that given that quote right there the status seems pretty strong with you three um, in, in leadership positions. Uh, so she also stressed that when women and girls are not given equal opportunities, it is even more difficult for them to be represented in leadership roles. So I want you all to take a moment to reflect on what it means for you to be serving in these leadership positions that you all are in, to be a black woman in your role um, in, a, in a very prominent community. You know, this is the Metro Atlanta area, DeKalb County and Fulton County representing those areas. And Clayton, I represent mean? Clayton too. I can't, and I can't Clayton. leave Clayton behind, College Park is in both. We can't leave Clayton out, Clayco. Shout out to all of our Clayco people. We can't leave Clayton out as well. But these three major counties uh, surrounding the Metro Atlanta area, what does it mean to you to be sitting on this panel today and representing that? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. I think one of the things that that I always plays in my mind um, is the fact that being the first uh, does not mean that I was the first woman who was qualified to do this job. It does not mean that I was the first African American qualified to do this job. Uh, and I and I think a lot about where we could be when we have the opportunity to tap into all of our talent, because I think with 125 years of history and actually 126 now in 2021, uh, actually found in 1895, but the fact that we haven't been able to tap into our potential as a community galvanizes me. It excites me. It also makes me sad about where I know we could be if we had, if we really had dug deep in, and found all of the talent that resides in college park. But I know that in this position, I'm committed to making sure that we do hear and we, that we do get input from everyone in our community. We have so many things to offer and 
most pe- most communities of 13,000 people in the state do not boast the second largest convention center in the state, do not share part of the world's busiest airport or have their own arena. Uh, we have 36 hotels in our community. We are a highly complex operation that can only get better if we tap into the diversity uh, or the strength of our diversity. So I'm certainly committed to doing that every step of the way. I know my mentor is as well, and I know Mayor Burks is as well, but I just think that it's it's a real opportunity for us in these positions to, to be able to, to reach out so much more broadly than we have in the past and, and see where our cities can go. Love that. Mayor Burks, how about you? Well, you know, for me, <laughs> as, as being a, a mayor of the most diverse city, it was important for me to run. And every day when I see little girls and they see me, and they see that they can do this to be mayor is my inspiration. So I am so grateful for the opportunity to to serve the most diverse community and to have uh, many of of our community members who, who have not seen women in a leadership role to be able to see that it's possible to do. And so I take every opportunity to not only show leadership, but to pull people up along with me. I think that's one of the most important things as a leader. You know, as as Mayor Motley, uh, Motley Broom said, it's it's okay to be first, but once you're first, what does that mean? You know, you 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 have to show the value of who you are. The first is just the first step. The continuation of showing your work is what will will live with people in terms of who you are. And so that for me is very important as as the mayor, of, you know, she's saying 13,000. I wish we had an arena and everything else with the, with a population of that size. But it's it is leveraging our community because 75% more than 75% of our businesses are foreign born um, our refugees and immigrants, um, making sure that they see that with leadership and, and particularly with female leadership that we can grow and thrive. And so I always continuously make sure in terms of a message of empowerment, that is what I want to continue to do. And as being a female mayor, that's what I, I hope shows with my work. It shows, it, it certainly does show. And we thank you for that. And what about you, Mayor Ingram? So um, I echo what Mayor Burks and Mayor Motley Bruma said. And I also think it's important um, as a woman and as a leader, I think when we think about being role models, yes, we're absolutely um, role models, whether we like it or not. Um, for little girls, brown, black and brown girls, women, of, girls of color, right? To be able to look up to and aspire and be able to touch and, and be accessible to them. But I also think about the many times where um, as a woman and as I'm married, I have a daughter, um, and my mom stays with us now, like a lot of times people will make you feel like you have to wait and kind of put your dreams on hold that you can't do it, have it all, so to speak, that you're, you, you have to like do things in a certain way or, you know, you got to wait till you do the family and then, you know, to the kids are this age. And, to, and I, I hope that, um, you know, being a leader and being a woman who is married and has a daughter who's 11 and I'm a softball mom because she's really busy in that. And then I have a full time, like that it sends a message that you don't have to wait, um, that when it is your, when you're called and when you purpose to do something and when you feel that is what God is leading you to do, that you can do it. Um, and that, yes, you know, I have pretty long days, but the reward is knowing that I'm fulfilling my purpose and that I'm being able to be a wife, a mother, um, a mayor, a you know, program special attorney, like all of those things, a daughter to a senior mom and being able to really be impactful, right? And do things that are impacting our community um, and mentor. I think is really important um, as, as they've said, that, you know, being the first or not the last or just being able to be a black female mayor of a city, right? Um, 
what about others? What about those who you come in contact with who have aspirations as well? Making sure that you're making yourself available to have those conversations and be candid, right? Um, with, with people so that we can continue to help each other grow and help inspire um, and support and promote each other. You all wear so many hats, um, as you said, just being a mom and a daughter at the same time and, you know, and a full time professional. And then, of course, helping run a city and all these other hats that you all wear. Uh, when we rewind back to the 1900s, we think about um, women having to fight and, and wear many hats at that point, too. Would love to take a deep dive into that and think about how did women um, and this may be a question for Mayor Burks and, and of course, um, anyone who feels uh, empowered to, to weigh in on this, but how did women achieve suffrage in the 1900s and what impact did this have on the American society? Well, to that point, you know, and we have two questions about it. It was very interesting that when you think about our constitution, it was all men were created with equal. You know, you, you heard some other people not mention in there women. And so with that, it's it's been a journey um, for women to, to be a part of the voting movement. And so you saw that with uh, the 1920s and it happened before the 1920s. This has been an ongoing um, struggle that women have faced and tried to come together. But it was with the 1920s that you saw that galvan galvanization of states voting to allow women to have the right to vote. And with that, it became an amendment to our constitution. And so the struggle for women to vote has been a long struggle. Um, it has been a collaboration both for women and men of power at that time to allow women to have the opportunity to vote. Um, but this is still a struggle that we continue. You know, it, as we talked about the first question, it's why did it take so long now for us to be in this type of position? Um, and I'll turn to my other mayors for their input as well. Well, being a member of the amazing Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, um, our first act of public service was the women's suffrage movement in 1913. And organizing uh, with women of different cultures, different race, different organizations to really come together to fight for the right to vote, right, um, for women because as Mayor Burke said, it's all men were created equal. Um, you know, initially it was just white men who owned property. So it wasn't even all men, right? So there's been a level of really um, disenfranchisement that different demographics have felt. But we know that, you know, our power is in our vote. You know, as, as, as citizens in this country, our power is the right to be counted and the right to vote. Right, so to be counted in the census that brings money into our communities, oftentimes our you know people leave their power on the table, right, by not being counted. And the other is the, and that comes around every ten years, and then it is the right to vote in every election. I don't care if it's there. There's one thing on the ballot. If it's just a referendum, if it's just a question. Being able to vote and exercise that power, there are a lot of people who did not have that power or have that right. That right was taken from them or suppressed or they were kept, I mean, played a number of games, Jim Crow, right, and Jim Crow 2.0 now. So the right to, to vote is so powerful. And if it were not that powerful, people wouldn't be trying to suppress it, right? And so I think it is in, important to know, yes, as women, um, that we were not necessarily created equal in this country. It was a fight, there was a movement led by women and organizations that secured that right to vote. But it's not enough just to have it. We have to educate, inform, and empower people to exercise it repeatedly. Um, and that, that becomes the challenge. And I hope that that becomes, as people learn, you know more about the voting rights movement throughout this country over decades that they realize, you know, really for themselves, not because somebody else told them, but how important and how sacred it is and how, you know, every time there's an opportunity, it should be exercised. And to know, again, women led the way and continue to lead the way. And even in voting demographics, right, women generally outvote men, right? The majority of the electorate 
um, who turn out to vote are women. And Black women are becoming a much more powerful voting block as well. And so, you know, it's really understanding our power and exercising it. That's huge. And I see Mayor Motley Broom is going to add as well to that. I mean, just so many important points mentioned so far. I agree with my colleagues. Let's leave it at that. I, we, we had a we had an election in uh, in our city four years ago that was decided by two votes. So, and and that's a quarter of the voting power on our council because we have four council members. So when people tell me, "Oh, it doesn't really matter," you know, my vote doesn't count. It absolutely does. And it can literally change the course of a city or a country. So I grew up knowing that people who looked like me had died for that right. And to never, ever take it for granted. I, I remember my, going in the voting booth with my mother and, you know, she, and it was the, you know, Chad's and the, you know, you push the, push the thing through the, I, I don't know all the terminology, but it, it just felt so important when she would say, okay, go right here. This is who we're voting for. This is, this is how we're, how it's going to count. So it's, it's always just been something that I build everything else around when it's time to vote. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, because I recognize that the people have the power. I mean, my mentor and I talk about this all the time. People have the power and whether they choose to exercise it or not can, can mean the difference between a community thriving or going in a completely different direction. That's very true. And we all know we have huge municipal elections coming up all across the state of Georgia. So everybody make sure to be ready to vote on November the 2nd. Um, and there's also elections happening before then as well. So go to my voter page, type that into Google. All you type it in is my voter page, Georgia, and it'll come right up. You just type in your name, your address, and you'll see what upcoming elections there are because it's so important that we vote in these local elections, that we vote in the midterms and the presidential. So please, please, please make sure we are using our voting power as was stressed. Let's talk about equity and equality and empowerment. And that was something that um, I think we all see in, in our spaces, whether you're a you know, working in the professional scene or working in the activism scene or, uh, or even in, in, in any space. Um, how would you say you're incorporating those values into the work that you do? And, and we can even break down the difference between equity and equality as well, which we know equity is being fair and equality is, is, requiring, is requiring equally, um, you know, to be equally distributed for a lack of better words. And that's just the basic terminology. But how would you say that you incorporate these uh, important concepts of equality and equity into your work and why is it important to do so? Well, I, I guess for me, one of the things when it comes to looking at our community, our community is, um, we, it is ma minority majority when you look at Clarkston and making sure that our community has access to resources is critical. And so for me, it is ensuring that equity, you know, you know when you, you've seen the drawings, you can have equality where, you know, you have the people and, and they can kind of see, they have access to the little boxes and they're, they're looking at the, the, the stadium. And equity is making sure that everyone has the right access so that everyone is able to, to be able to see the game. Um, but then once you are able to see it, you need to turn around and empower people, you know, make people, I always say, you can give someone a fish, but if you teach them how to fish, then they can thrive and then they can turn around and create businesses and do other things as a result of you showing them and empowering them. So for me, in my community, I want to empower our business owners. I want to empower people to be business owners to make sure that they have an opportunity to have wealth. I want them to look at generational success. All of those things are critical in terms of how we do empowerment and equity and equality. 
And it's being proactive and it's being active. Like you said, you know, wanting to see them do well. It's also being out there, right? How are you going to know if they're doing well if you're not out in the community, if you're not engaging with these businesses at events or at their establishments, right? Anything else uh, to be added to that? I always think about uh, equity in the sense that if we are going to tap into the potential of our of our community, we have to be equitable with uh, the way we we allocate our resources because different people need different things. I'm on the Equity and Inclusion Commission of the Georgia Municipal Association, when, and we've talked for about a year about some of the issues that our communities around the state and around the country are facing. Uh, one of the areas that we haven't really talked about very much is people with disabilities uh, and how we need to work to ensure that we are incorporating our policies, our practices to ensure that they have an opportunity to engage and contribute as well. Because what someone with any, you know, a particular disability might face may not be something that, uh, that an, an average or a typical uh, able person might. So, but we have, to, we have to meet people where they are because if we're, if we're, if we're given people, I mean, it, it's, if we gave everybody a car, but you're, you have a disability and you can't get in it, what, what's the point, right? And so the, the idea is that we get as close as possible to getting people, as, as Mayor Burke said, the, the resources they need to thrive and understand what those resources are so we can be the best advocates on behalf of our residents. That's so important. Uh, and I, I think you all are so large um, because it's so important, it's so necessary. And we know that also with Mayor Ingram, uh, we, we know that equity is really a big part of your experience in your community, especially when we talk about uh, gentrification. And that's something that you've been very passionate about working toward ending or eliminating um, in, so, in a great capacity. So could you talk about how that plays a role with, with your work? Yes, yeah, so, you know, I, for me, equality is all residents are equal. They are valued the same. Um, we really are striving to have an inclusive community. Um, we were one of the cities that became a part of Welcoming America and committing to ensuring that all residents in our city, regardless of whatever demographic you want to subscribe or look at, feel valued and are equal and viewed as equal human beings. And so I think that's the equality part. And you're right, the, the equity part is, we are a city that is positioned for and is experiencing unprecedented growth. And, I, and we, in order to ensure that our residents who have been with us when, you know, things were not as prosperous get to grow with us, our legacy residents and our legacy businesses, we have to be strategic and intentional about how we grow. And so we um, act on June 21st, we adopted our equitable growth and inclusion strategic plan um, because there are things that we need to really have some systemic eyes on and a systemic approach to addressing to make sure that we grow in that way. And so there's four pillars in that plan. Um, the first is of course, community engagement. It has to our community has to be engaged. We have to create ways for our community to be more involved in the decision making process. Because the reality of it is, is that um, change is only sustainable if our people are powered, empowered and equipped to demand it, right? And so the things that we do and the things that we are, are working on within our city regarding equity and inclusion, it must be with community engagement and looking at how we can um, you know, really look at different ways to engage our community um, and our decision-making process. And then the second is just industry. Um, we are a city and when, when we started looking at this work and it's like, we have a lot of warehouses and you know, why is it that we have so much industrial use in our city? And um, you know, then when I realized that industrialization in our city is rooted in racism, 
you know, I realized it wasn't just happenstance or a coincidence that we were focusing on this work at this time. It is really a mandate. Um, on July 15th, 1912, the East Point City Council um, voted unanimously to require all Black people in the city to live in 45 acre tract of land, which, is, which was immediately adjacent to three fertilizer plants, an oil plant, and a chemical plant. And it was so stink, they called it stink town. Um, and they lived in substandard housing at best. It was shanty housing. Um, and their reasons were, you know, white people didn't want to live by black people and they wanted to make sure that the workers were close to work so they wouldn't be late. All of these self-serving reasons. But unfortunately, that industrialization near residential areas spread to other pockets of our city. And we are looking at ways to have more equitable industrial land use that is more compatible with um, the residential areas around it that, you know, contributes to the quality of life of our residents and how we repurpose some of these industrial businesses that have been closed for a really long time. And then understanding that housing is a fundamental right. Um, the third pillar is inclusive housing. And so and looking at our ways to be able to have inclusionary zoning to ensure that, that as we grow, we are growing housing for every income level, right? You can't grow a city and only focus on either end of the spectrum or just one and not the other. Like we are a city that is extremely diverse. Our diversity is our strength. And when I say diversity, not just in demographics, like we are about 75, 77% African-American, 16% white, about 10 or 11% Hispanic. We have a significant LGBTQIA population in our city, um, a large senior population, but we also have diversity in our housing stock. Like literally you can get a 500 square foot to a 7,000 square foot house in the city of East Point with, in an area with resort style amenities, right? And that's great. Because that means regardless of income level, we have housing in our city that every that people can afford. And we have to grow in a way intentionally to ensure that that happens. So for multifamily developments, looking, making sure that it's mixed income and making sure that we're growing housing for everyone. Um, and as we look at development, making sure that we have equitable economic development because we can absolutely grow our city uh, without and revitalize and redevelop our city without the negative impacts of gentrification, which is involuntary displacement, right? We can grow in a way that respects the people who are here and connects um, our residents to the growth that is happening. So as we welcome in new people, our residents are able to reap the benefits as well. And so community benefits, looking at ways to um, ensure that we have businesses that are contributing to you know, our um, path plan or making sure that there are local livable wage jobs in our city. So that's, I can talk about it for like a really long time because I'm really passionate about it, but equity and inclusion, um, the goal, our goal, my goal is to ensure that it's more than a cliche and that we absolutely put the system and infrastructure in place to grow in that way so that as we grow, we can be a model to others. Yeah, I mean, it's such an important and loaded topic. You could talk about this, I'm sure, for, for hours just because it, there's so many layers and so much to it. But when we also talk about, you know, equality, it's important to, to recognize that, you know, despite the Equal Pay Act of 1963, women are still earning less than men. And analyzing some of the most recent Census Bureau data from 2018, uh, women of all races earned on average just 82 cents for every $1 earned by men of all races. So why is it important to address the gender pay gap in the workplace? And how do we do that? How do we go about that? What, what strategies have you seen that have been effective uh, to really get that, that going? And who wants to start off with taking that one? You know, I think it's important because the work doesn't change, right? So like if you're doing the same job as a man, it's not like because you're a woman that you have less responsibilities often, either because you're assigned more or because you take on more, right? Um, there's absolutely a need and importance for equal pay. Um, it's unfortunate that we're still having those conversations and that we still have to have those conversations. But it is also fortunate that um, more and more women are breaking and shattering the glass ceiling and becoming um, leaders, CEOs of organizations where we can go in and change the system, right? The system is not going to change um, without the, the demand, right? Without the demand and without people in the positions being there in the positions that can make those decisions. 
can actually make a bring about systemic change. And so, you know, we deal with those situations as we look bring on new directors within our city and bring on new staff, right? Like, so are are they paid comparable? Is it based upon the work um, and the responsibility? And is it competitive with you know, just salaries across the board, not looking at what men are getting paid, but like, who, you know, what is the competitive salary for these jobs? And so um, those are definitely things that we have been very vocal about. Um, I serve on a council with nine of us and five of us are women. Um, and so, you know, it's, you, you, I believe in you walk it like you talk it. You can't just say things and not do it. You have to live your values. Um, and I think it, you know, really starts with, Again, inspecting what is happening within your organization to make sure that those disparities don't exist. And if they do, addressing them head on and making those adjustments and those changes. And so we've seen some gains within the city of East Point in that respect. You said a few things that, that stood out and, and it's, it's almost, you know, being involved, right? Like you are sitting on these committees, you're involved in these different roles. So you can have some oversight. So you can say, hey, that's not right. Hey, we need to do this. But also on us too, being knowledgeable about, you know, before we take a job, also looking at what, what that salary range is, what are other people accepting and, and being that advocate. So it is, it definitely is twofold or if not threefold or more, uh, but I, I definitely appreciate the points that you brought up. And Mayor Burks, how about you? You know, funny thing is, I saw that the play Hamilton, and one of the parts that they said was, you have to be in the room to make decisions. So it's very critical as women that we are in those leadership roles, because when we're there, we have the opportunity to get people to think differently. And one of the other pieces that, you know, as, as uh, Mayor Motley Broom and Mayor Ingram keep saying back and forth, they're a mentor, mentee. That is very critical too, because having those role models to bounce things off in terms of salary negotiations, um, understanding your value and your worth um, before you even go to the job is very critical um, to make sure that you um, have the opportunity to, to have those mentors to be in your life. Um, but it's also, again, making sure that as an elected official, we look at what we do with our employees, making sure that we are accountable and making sure that we do in terms of that equity. I'm very proud when I was a council member that as a council member, we voted to um, start our minimum wage or our living wage at $15 an hour. You know, that was very important for us to make that position as a city that, you know, even from our basic employees that we want to make sure that you have a livable wage. But then it takes a step late, a step further where when we look at who we hire um, from a corporate perspective, making sure that those people based on their experience are receiving comparable pay. One of the issues that a lot of women face is that they're oftentimes sandwich generations where they're raising kids and they're also taking care of their parents. And so sometimes um, people don't see the value of that hard work and they're often, their hours are reduced and that's what you see a lot of times. And so when their hours are reduced, the pay is reduced, um, their value is reduced or they have to step away from their positions. And so that experience from them being first, taking care of their family first, that plays a role in terms of their ability to get equal pay. So, you know, making sure that we have support for people, especially women and who are caregivers, that's very critical. Um, making sure that we provide information and resources. So as women climb, we are helping them to climb, but we're helping everyone to climb along the way, um, particularly with minority groups as well. So it's important that we always think about how can we lift up as we are climbing up. And that should always be our thought process as we're, we're looking from a corporate perspective as well as from um, our government perspective as well. Absolutely. And Mayor Motley Broom, is there anything else you would like to add to those uh, really strong points that were just shared? I think they've summed it up. <laughs> what about, well, do you have any suggestions maybe to, to companies to consider about what they could do to address the gender divide and, and, you know, create stronger representation for women in the workplace? Well, it's not just 
it's not just talking the talk. You got to walk the walk. Uh, and the policies that you put in place to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to do their best work can be very different depending on, on who's in your organization. And I think the best way that organizations can do that is to actually talk to the people who work there and not have this approach that just because you're in leadership, you know it all. I, I, I just, I can't accept that I've got all the answers. And we, I think good leaders surround themselves with people who are smarter than them and, and make sure that they've got subject matter experts around them that they can trust. Uh, and the, I, I don't know how to do every job uh, that is within the city of College Park. We have over 450 employees who do an amazing job for our residents and our visitors. But they know how to do their jobs. So it's really, it's, it's really short-sighted if I as a leader come in and say, this is how something should go. I am not a public safety expert. I am not a public works expert, but we've got really great people within those departments who know what they're doing. And so if we're not listening to the people who are on the ground, who, who need the support, you know, I, I think of myself in this role as someone who gives people, no matter who they are, no, no matter if they're employees, residents, business owners, the tools that they need to thrive. And, it, and that's, that's how I approach it. So definitely just really meeting people where they are and understanding that you don't know everything. We don't know everything. There are people we can learn from in all kinds of spaces. Uh, so we'll take a little pivot here into a different topic. Uh, we know that COVID-19 has affected all of our communities and um, as leaders, you all have had to respond. So um, with the pandemic negatively impacting wages, job security and benefits of women, what policies and programs are needed on a federal, state or local government level to address these areas? Uh, so we can maybe start with uh, Mayor Burks and then go from there. Okay. Um, well, the good thing is we as local municipalities receive that ARPA funding or our COVID funding. Um, and so that gives us a lot of opportunities to do things like workforce development and do other projects that can help our residents. Um, I think those are very critical as we're looking at the opportunity. This is kind of our one shot where, you know, we have several millions of dollars coming to our cities as well as the opportunity from a state level to be able to make programs and infrastructure changes that can help our residents. The other piece is that, you know, we are trying to make sure we encourage in terms of COVID our residents to make sure they get vaccinated um, and providing those resources to do that. I cannot emphasize that point um, when and wherever we can um, to encourage that so that as we're making these improvements, um, we're, not, we're not dealing with the huge cost of people being in hospitals as a result of COVID. That's, that's a big issue right now with our community. Our hospital beds are filled, um, you know, as, as me working um, for Fulton DeKalb Hospital Authority, health is very important to me. So making sure in terms of our funding that we look at programs to address that, um, making sure that again, what, whatever we can do in terms of workforce development to utilize not only and train up people who were in other industries that were really impacted by COVID, but then taking those trained skills and using those within our community so everyone benefits from it as well. So I think those are some things that we can do and looking at those programs and um, infrastructure, broadband, all of those things that can help our residents um, come through the process of dealing with COVID because COVID isn't over. 
you know, we, we just need to be honest about this. Um, we're, we're going to continuously deal with COVID for probably the next year or so um, between the Delta variant and what we see with the fall and going forward. But it's critical that as cities, um, I encourage our residents to make sure that you engage with your council to find out how and what they're doing in terms of spending that are for funding to know what what how they're going to invest in your community. I think that's very important and to make sure that you are part of those conversations, that you have that dialogue to find out what makes sense. Um, as Mayor Motley Broom says, you, you know, we all don't have the answers and it's very critical to make sure that uh, we involve our community because it is going to be our community who benefits from it. That's right, that's right. And Mayor Motley Broom, would you like to add um, anything on that? I know that with uh, Fulton County and Clayton County, I've seen resources that have been shared, uh, whether it's rental assistance or where to go get vaccines, um, anything you'd like to share on those fronts? Well, uh, being home to the second largest convention center in the state, we were happy to host uh, the Fulton County Board of Health and work in conjunction with them to have, in, have vaccines administered uh, at the Georgia International Convention Center. And by the time that that program wound down, we had done over 66,000 vaccines for the community. And it's still not enough. It's still not enough. If you, if you look at where the cases are happening in our community, it's disproportionately on the south side of Fulton County because we don't have the vaccination numbers that are as high as the north side. And it, it breaks my heart because COVID has been so, so incredibly destructive to our community in so many different ways, not just the, the human toll, which has been incredible, but also the economic toll because we are highly reliant on tourism, hospitality, hospitality and travel. And as I said, we have 36 hotels in, in our city. And right now we are still below 70% occupancy. Whereas in a normal time, we'd probably be in the eighties or nineties. It, it dipped as low as into about 15% occupancy at when COVID was at its height uh, last year. So the revenue that we've lost as a city is um, that the, the ARPA funds that we received are just a drop in the bucket, honestly. I know it's, it's game changing for a lot of communities, but uh, we have losses that are somewhere between 15 and $20 million. Our ARPA funds are about 5.6 million, I believe. So it certainly helps and we are grateful for it. Uh, but we are also looking to the state uh, and their, uh, their programs, including um, support for infrastructure and um, support for, for those that have taken uh, communities like ours that, that have had a severe economic uh, distress as a result of, of COVID. But I think one of the most important things that we can do, and I had the opportunity to sit uh, at a round table yesterday with Senator Ossoff, we had a great discussion about this was that we, we need to be, have people in place to be ready for all the development that's, that's around the corner. On the federal level, infrastructure is the buzzword. And I know that my mentor is going to talk a little bit about infrastructure probably. And, and I won't steal her thunder on this because she's, she's got all the details about what's going on in East Point with that. But we need to make sure that our residents are prepared for all of these jobs that are going to be coming the demand for people who can make sure that our sewers are running properly, that our broadband is where it needs to be, that our roads, our bridges, our, our rail, all the things that are so key to moving people and things around. We need to make sure that our residents are ready to be able to have those opportunities for those good paying jobs that will keep them and their families safe and secure moving forward. Mentor and Mayor Holiday Ingram, would you like to add to any of that? Yeah, so, um, you know, this, this pandemic, everyone, it might have hit us differently, but this was, every, people around the world um, were impacted by this pandemic. Um, and 
you know, we had the first case in Fulton County um, identified at one of our schools in East Point. Um, and so, you know, that was like March, early March. Then we went on the lockdown, everybody locked down March 16th. Um, and the first week in April, we started distributing food because at that point it was like, we gotta get back to basics. Like we have to be there for our residents. We have to bridge the gap. I kept assuring them and continue to assure them that we will get through this together. And that means like using our network resources, relationships and influence to bridge those gaps. So from the first week in April of 2020 to now we've distributed over 8 million pounds of food and continue to distribute food weekly. Um, we basically, pivoted and repurposed our recreation center to really be our food distribution hub to get food out into our community through our faith-based partners. Um, we were the second city in the state to issue a mask mandate. So when you talk about what can be done at the federal and state level, like this is, we're not talking about making widgets. This is a life or death, right? We are talking about saving lives and that is no place for politics. It is really, we should be following the science, the data and the medical experts and their recommendations. And so we led the way with that. We did started testing the first week in May. They said, well, in order to start thinking about reopening, you need to make sure that people are able to be tested. We did that, we were giving out PPE. We now have a weekly vaccination site in the city. And um, in February of 2020, our unemployment rate was around 4.5, 4.7%. And by the end of April of 2020, it was 20% and it stayed in double digit percentages through the whole of 2020. And, you know, it's doing better, but what it said to us is we have to help our residents with workforce development skills. People were finding themselves unemployed, not based on performance or anything that they did, it's just the way that the pandemic hit and, you know, disrupted industry after industry and business after business and how that played into the livelihoods of our residents. So we offer um, Amazing Stories Foundation through a partnership with them, TV and Film Apprenticeship Program, where we um, have had three seasons, they call it, but three cohorts of people have 100% um, placement rate in the TV and film industry on sets through on a number of different types of programming um, and are making livable wages. Um, we also partner with SEFCA for a construction ready program to provide training in the construction field. Um, because there will always be a need for builders. Um, and with the TV film industry, we watched a lot of TV. I mean, I was net doing watching seasons on Netflix, right? Uh, so the future of work. Also, SEPCA has a high um, placement rate in livable wage. Strive ATL is a logistics um, workforce development program that we partner with, provide livable wage jobs as well. And we were the only state, the only city in the state of Georgia and in the Southeast region of the country to receive the EPA, Federal Environmental Protection Agency, Brownfield um, grant, workforce development grant to train people for the future of work in the environment mental field, right? Those careers that will be around regardless of what happens. And we also realized we, were, we have a bridging the gap resource request form for COVID or just resources that are needed. And people need a lot of financial assistance. So we were able to um, use some of our CARES Act funding after we finally got it after that really long fight with the county. Um, we allocated some of that for utilities assistance for our residents. We then applied for emergency solutions grants and received about 152,000 for utilities and um, rental assistance. And then recently we were awarded 550,000 for and CDBG grant funding for rental and mortgage assistance. And then also collaborating with the county that has a real, um, rental assistance program and with the Department of Community Affairs that has millions upon millions of dollars for rental assistance and mortgage assistance, but being able to connect the dots. So we are in the process of hiring a program coordinator to help people, connect people to these resources and make sure that we are helping our residents get the support that they need during this very trying and difficult time. And also looking at how we continue to do this as we move forward. East Point had our demographics provide a lot of opportunity for us to really bridge the gaps and connect our residents to resources. And I don't get to serve just one type or one group of East Pointer. I serve all East Pointers. And in doing that, I have, it is incumbent upon me to make sure that we're doing all that we can to connect people to the resources they need to thrive 
um, and to continue to, to thrive with their families. And so it is, COVID is, I think, um, shown us some levels and ways to be more efficient with how we do things, but it is absolutely, and it should have absolutely taught everyone that we have to be people focused. We have to put people over party, politics, profit, personality, any of those things, right? Like we have to focus on people and grow and lead with people in mind. You do have to be people focused and please, Mayor Burks. So I was gonna say, I, I wanna thank my, my council because of last year before I was on council, um, they did make sure in terms of allocation, we had about 1.9 1. 1. million that we spent on food assistance, on rental assistance, on all of those things, especially in our community, when you look at the devastation in terms of the number of people who were unemployed. And we continue, we've allocated over a million dollars now towards business assistance, mortgage assistance, um, rental assistance, uh, health programs that we're trying to make sure that we put in place because the other piece that is a reminder is that we need to make sure that we are protecting our residents because those things that made us higher at risk um, in terms of uh, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, those things have not gone away. And those are factors in terms of preventative health that we need to make sure that we do the investment in our communities to make sure that today it was COVID, it could be something else, or it will be a variation of COVID. So it is a matter of us making sure that we do those investments in terms of workforce development, in terms of health, in terms of food and food insecurity, that we continue as a city to make sure that we invest in our people because that's who makes our cities run. That's why we're here in existence for our people. That sure is. And we've talked a lot about uh, the communities and the cities and the people and, and what you all are doing to help support um, and, and especially with women, you know, bridging the gap and, and ensuring equality and equity in, in our spaces. Let's, as we come to the conclusion of this conversation, let's, let's take a dive uh, deeper into your own journeys uh, with each of you coming into these spaces as mayors. Uh, what led you all? Um, what were some of the challenges that you all personally had to overcome, you know, before even this year, before COVID, before, you know, the recent hurdles? What challenges did you overcome along your journey as a Black woman mayor in your city? And we can start with um, Mayor Motley Broom, and then we'll go over to Mayor Holiday Ingram, and then Mayor Burks. I had about six weeks of being mayor before COVID hit. So I, I can't really say like even before COVID what the challenges were because the entire time I've been mayor, it's pretty much been pandemic and chaos. I mean, I what? just, it just, it, it, it's just been that way. And mm -hmm. you, you learn to adapt. I think one of the things that I learned rather quickly is that you have to establish some walls and some boundaries because when people talk about the impact that being an elected official takes on your personal life your family life that's that's not a joke that's a real thing and if you aren't intentional about creating space for yourself for your relationships then it it all it it will suffer and so you have to be very, very intentional about it. And, but I think that that makes me better when I take that time for myself. Um, I think I'm going to see my mentor tomorrow morning. We're going to work out tomorrow morning. Yep. See, yep. 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 Um, what, what, wait, what? what? Oh, right. But okay. All right. All right. Anyway, but but, but when you, when you take the time for yourself and you're good to yourself, then you can be good for everybody else. If you keep on giving all, you know, till the well is dry and there's nothing left for you, uh, it, it just doesn't put you in the best position to be able to serve others. And so I, I still, I, sometimes I can't do the things that I love to do as much. I, I am a, an avid potter. And so I'm, I take pottery classes and make a lot of mugs for people 
Um, and that is one of the ways in which I sort of refill the well and try to make sure that I take time to reflect and meditate and, and be active as well. And some, some of the way, some, sometimes you get those added benefits of that because since I walk to our rec center to work out, people see me on main street and they're like, I always see you walking or I see you out and about, and I should be visible. I should be accessible to people, uh, because I'm here for them and I'm here to serve. So I get my steps in and I get to see residents and we get to chat and have all that, all, all those, all those good times. But, um, I think no matter, you know, if you, if you make the decision to, to run for office, um, it really is, it, it, it changes the dynamic of your entire family, uh, no matter who, who that encompasses and, and to be, to be cognizant of that. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't change anything. I love it. I absolutely love, um, being in the room where it happens, Mayor Burks. I, I went the day after you, you, I think you were there on Saturday and I went on Sunday because I saw you, on, I saw your post on Facebook. Uh, but it, it was just, it's, it's exhilarating to be able to have, to have an impact on your community, to be able to say, this thing happened and I was a part of it. Like, it, and, and to know that it's going to change the trajectory of people's lives that you'll never meet. They'll never know you had a hand in it but that, that builds your community. It is an honor. It is a privilege and I'm grateful every day. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that Mayor Motley Broom. And I, I know the community is grateful to have you leading and serving in, in various capacities. And so are we. So we appreciate you being here and sharing that. And what about you, Mayor Dina Holiday Ingram? What led you to stepping into this role and, and what did you have to overcome along your journey? Um, what led me to stepping into this role? So I believe that I was born to serve and called to lead and service is the rent we pay for our room here on earth, right? So I was went to FAMU undergrad, go FAMU. Um, and then I went to Howard for law school and at Howard, I was tra trained to be a social engineer. And that is to go out into society and engineer a society that is more fair, more just, more equitable, more inclusive um, for the community through looking at policies and laws and ordinances, like how do you change the system? And um, that training really, you know, a lot of the, you know, attorneys in the civil rights movement are graduates or were graduates of Howard University School of Law, Charles Hamilton Houston, um, Thurgood Marshall, right? Um, and so we were, that was indoctrinated into me in addition to my family and my mother and father who just like really taught me and showed me what service meant. And so as I moved here to East Point, you know, and, and began to get engaged, I realized that there was an opportunity in the space to be very impactful in my local community uh, regarding the things we want to see done, right? Regarding, you know, whether or not we have a path within our city, whether or not we have more quality of life types of um, things within our city, whether or not we have events that are, you know, that are respect and celebrate all cultures in our city, whether or not, you know, there are places for people to get. There are just so many things that we can do at the local level that absolutely impact the quality of life of our residents on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I said, here I am, um, knocked on some doors. I had only been here three years uh, when I ran for council and the residents chose to allow me to serve them. And then said, you know, now that we are, after, as I campaigned from uh, council, I told the residents that we would reach sensible solutions and take steps forward for East Point. We did that. Um, when I ran for mayor, I said that we would continue progress together. We've done that as well. There's been a lot of unprecedented growth happening in our city and, and, you know, we're continuing to be able to, you know, attract unprecedented development within the city, do unprecedented improvements to our um, infrastructure, like sidewalks, roads, just a number of different things. And yes, we have a lot of infrastructure needs within our city, 
um, over $326 million in water, sewer, and stormwater infrastructure needs that we inherited. And just like other cities, my neighbor cities, College Park and Hapeville and cities across this country, this aging infrastructure is a challenge. It is a huge challenge. Um, and you know, that's that's fundraising like no other, right? Trying to find revenue sources that um, there's not, we can't be our ways out way out of it. There's not a I can't, there's no way to be thinking about, okay, we'll just charge fees. I mean, it's, it's too much. And so we've been really, you know, working with our state partners and our federal partners um, to get revenue sources into our city to be able to deal with that very huge challenge um, that, yes, existed pre-COVID. We will be using some of our opera funds to help address that because this is the first time in history that cities are getting direct funding in this way from the federal government and to be able to use um, for that, but we're also trying to leverage that with other sources of, of revenue. Um, I think the other, so that's from a city perspective around challenges, um, is infrastructure. It is our infrastructure is about like saving lives. People need to be able to drive on safe roads and streets. They need to know that bridges are not going to collapse. They need to know that the water that they drink is clean and safe, right? All of that deals with infrastructure. Um, and it is unfortunate. It's unfortunate that so many real issues get politicized, but I am still remain optimistic that we'll reach those people focused solutions and realize this is not about party, this is about saving lives as well. The, the other challenge I'll speak from a personal note um, as, as I wrap up is around being okay with saying no, right? Um, that is a hard lesson to learn um, and not feeling guilty, right? And this, you know, we get pulled on a number of different, I mean, like if, if I literally try to be at everything I get invited to or that is shared with me, is it just not humanly possible? I mentioned I'm a wife, I'm a mother. Um, my mother lives with us, right? Like I have to prioritize my family. Um, and Mayor Motley Broom mentioned that, like you, you have to be able to set um, boundaries and also but show people that, and, and I think people respect that. Right. Um, everybody knows I have a family. They know my daughter. They know my husband. Right. Um, and I have to make time for that when that happens. I can't be there for everybody else and not be there for my family. So um, being OK and getting to a point where you realize it's OK to say no um, and that you don't feel guilty about it. You take time for yourself. Um, all of those lessons that I think as women, we like learn and then relearn and then learn again and we do well. I'll speak for myself, like I have good seasons and then I'm like, I really need to do that thing again, right? Um, prioritize me. That is so real. Thank you for sharing that. And again, thanks. thank you for your leadership and, and all that you do and just sharing some of those moments so people understand it's not all pretty. There's a lot that goes into this. Uh, and Mayor Burks, what, what would you like to share about what led you to where you are and, and any challenges you've overcome? And, and then we'll have a couple more questions and, and, and that will be the end of our wonderful panel discussion for everyone tuning in. I, again, I wanna emphasize to our mayors, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here tonight. So I really have to emphasize that point. Um, my journey has been one where I've always been a member of, and done things of service, um, whether it's in my sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha, um, 29 years now, and I've always done service. So ironically, I had someone ask me to, to run for city council, and I said, no, I don't want to do that. So I was on planning and zoning, and they said, well, Beverly, if you don't run for council, there won't be any women even running for council at all. And so they knew my weak spot. And that was, I always wanna make sure in terms of our leadership, especially on the council level, we had diversity. So that's what got me to, to run because I, you know, as much as being a com community advocate, I recognize that policy makes the difference. And so being in, in the room, making those decisions um, at the table was very important for me. So, so I took that journey to that first step and became a councilwoman. And then I, I decided to run for mayor. And sometimes, you know, you have those unanswered prayers. So I didn't win. And I kind of understood why I didn't win because shortly after that, I had breast cancer. 
So with my breast cancer, um, you know, I went through all my treatment, but then the position to run for mayor came up again. And so while I was running for mayor, I was still going through my breast, breast cancer treatments as well in the midst of COVID <laughs> um, all at the same time. So, you know, it was one of those things where I had to follow my passion. And, you know, it was something where I was led to do. And so regardless of all that time, I always stayed in the community, stayed an active activist in the community, did programs, started groups, whatever, uh, was on the COVID task force, helped make sure we gave out 20,000 masks um, to our residents and did whatever we could in terms of pushing the vaccinations. But my journey was one where, you know, I had to do show a level of resilience um, by being not only going through treatments to end up, you know, ending my breast cancer, but also running and winning and going door to door. I went door to door during COVID, going through breast cancer treatments. Just that was how committed I was to this community. I love this community. Um, so a, a challenge, I guess, was up until last month I've always done all my meetings via Zoom so I had my first person meeting um, after all of these months almost nine months now of um, being virtual and so you know we're reopening our city but we're doing it cautiously and wisely um, because again the numbers are not going down they're going up and so we have to be mindful of that. Um, we also have to be mindful of how do we move forward? Again, you know, we're still going through the issues of COVID. Um, we're still trying to make sure in terms of supporting our residents that we provide resources and aid to them. Um, but we also have to worry about one of the bigger things, which is housing. Housing is very critical um, in our community because again, we're so small, we're 1.5 square miles, we're running out of space, right? And so we're having to balance um, our, our small inflection of gentrification, where now we're seeing $400,000, $500,000 homes in Clarkston, right? But making sure that we balance our residents because housing is a health disparity not having an address, not being able to say where you live is a problem, even for you to get a job, for you to live, the scare of losing your apartment, your house, all of those things are factors that we have to be mindful of. And so it's working with our apartment um, apartments to make sure that we can do what we can to ensure that our residents have a place to live. Those things are very important for us um, because that that is a mental mental stress on people and that that's something else we that is a challenge too for our residents um the impact of COVID and everything else has really impacted us from a mental health perspective and so we have to be mindful about that with our communities that we provide those resources for them um to be able to to, to thrive um and and that's very important for me so um, I'm very grateful for this journey. I would never, um, I, I can't tell you how, how blessed I am every day to love this city and to be a leader for this city and to have a wonderful council um, that is very supportive and willing to work and do those things for our residents. So those are, I, I can't necessarily say challenges, but they're amazing things that I have. Thank you for sharing that, Mayor Burke. Sir, you certainly are resilient, and we are thankful that you are here and that you've overcome so much, including your uh, cancer journey. Um, and, and just you've really shown resilience where you were knocking on those doors and still being out there. And, and it's shown in, in your success as well. Um, and you mentioned something you mentioned that, you know, you, you want you wanted to be a community advocate, but you also wanted to apply pressure on policy. So are there any uh, policies um, that three of you all can share that maybe you supported or you sponsored that directly improved gender equality um, or a program, if not a policy? And we can sort of go through that question 
uh, briefly here. So uh, Mayor Burks, maybe we can start with you and then. Well, I think when one of the things that I did when I was on council was to make sure in terms of our employees that they had um, paid maternity and paternity leave. Um, I thought that was very important um, to make sure in terms of family. Um, I'm, I'm very focused on family, but making sure that our employees had that opportunity and not have to worry about um, their pay to be able to spend the time with their family. So um, that was very important to me. Um, again, I, I try to make sure every time that I can is to have uh, programs and policies like this, programs like this to bring awareness about the importance of equity across the board, whether it's for women, minorities, those are all the things that have been extremely important because we are a welcoming city and we've had policies to ensure that we do those things that show a welcoming city um, for our residents, both our native born and our foreign born residents. So, so those things have been extremely important to make sure that um, I have policies, programs. I started like maybe two weeks after I became mayor to to have a community leaders council where I have all the community leaders from, from throughout the city meet on a monthly basis where we talk about the issues and concerns facing our residents. And so that they know when they have issues and concerns, we bring the resources to those meetings so that we can help our residents as well. Thank you for sharing. And Mayor Motley Broom or Mayor Holiday Ingram, would y'all like to add any policies or any um, initiatives that you supported. Um, and just, again, great things happening in Clarkson. So we appreciate you sharing that, Ms. Bur Mayor Burks. I think one of the most important things that uh, College Park is doing is, um, and I say it all the time, but we're building the community we deserve. And in that, we, we've had to sort of level up in a lot of ways because we are a small community of 13 and a half thousand people. Uh, and in some ways we have thought of ourselves as kind of a Mayberry-esque town when we have these, these very complex uh, operations happening within, within our city limits. So to that end, we've really worked on making sure that our departments are what our employees need. Uh, and no, none more so than human resources, because we've got to have a robust human resources department that where, where people feel that they can get their needs met. And that hasn't always necessarily been the case. So there has been a lot of work uh, through our interim city manager and, and others to make sure that we are providing the support for our employees, no matter who they are, to, to do their best work. And, and to feel like there is someone in their corner if they do have an issue. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of it has been internal thus far because uh, we want to make sure that we're working well um, as, as we continue to grow. Great to hear. That's great to and hear. Human I'll, resources um, is so important. Yes. And so I, I would just add, we passed the anti-discrimination ordinance um, that definitely prevents discrimination based on gender, gender identity, sexual identity, um, and expanded that level of protection and put an administrative process in place um, to ensure that there is a system that if things happen or when things happen, that we respond in a way that is equitable and inclusive. And so, um, yeah, that's the policy I would look up. Thank you all for sharing all of that. And again, making time. Our last question for this evening is, what words or uh, insight, words of encouragement, words of wisdom, any insight would you share with any young woman out there who may wanna run for office one day, who may wanna be the mayor of her city um, or city council member or some other uh, elected official position, what advice and encouragement would you share? So we can start with Mayor Holiday Ingram and then we'll work our way through the wonderful panelists. So the first thing that came to my mind is what um, my mentee, mentor, <laughs> my, Mayor Motley Broom says is that people get elected to serve. And some people serve themselves and other people serve people. 
Um, and I think it is important, especially in this day and time, that if you're thinking about doing, know that it is a sacrifice, um, that you, you are sacrificing your time, your, you know, you're giving your skills, it is rewarding, but you must be willing to make the sacrifice to serve people and not serve yourself. Um, because if we don't serve people, then the people in our community don't get what we, they need. And then we always want to try to blame people like external, like what happens outside of us versus what happens within. So, you know, I would say, make sure you're, you're really committed to serving people and that you um, are willing to bring that into every conversation and, to, and have used that as a lens as to everything that you deal with when you are serving as an elected official. Um, I would say that you should make sure that you um, really want to make this an impact on your community, right? So by, again, like not serving yourself, serving people, but think about how you can impact and change your community. And it's interesting when people are running and you have conversations with people, when you hear this a lot of like, I this and I'm a this and I'm a that, like no government is a dictatorship. There are some forms of government where, you know, the mayor has, um, you know, more authority over the day-to-day -day operations, but it really requires being a team player and a consensus builder. And you have to be able to get to a point where you understand how to be, uh, disagree without being disagreeable, agree to disagree, how to understand that people express their passion in a lot of different ways. And people might not always say things the way you want to hear them and might not feel as nice, but that's them expressing themselves, right? And being able to have that thick skin and really look at, so what's the issue? What is it that needs to be addressed and, and be solution focused? And I would say, um, let peace be your guide. In this political space, um, as an elected official, there's a lot of politics at play. Everything is fickle and temporal. You have to be guided by what you believe is right and be comfortable with the decisions that you make. And so my barometer is, can I, one, if somebody asks me why, can I articulate the reasoning? Whether they agree or disagree, a lot of times if you're able to share with people your reason, they can understand. And will I be able to go home, lay my head down on the pillow and have peace? Or will I be tossing and turning because you know, it just it wasn't the right thing to do or, you know, the way in which it was done, whatever, peace is a barometer. And then the third one is whether or not my daughter um, can look at me and still, you know, have pride that I'm her mom and, and a role model, right? So like not getting out of character, not, you know, really focusing on that. Because those are the things that all of the, you'll hear a lot of stuff in politics. But at the end of the day, it, it comes down to those simple things if you're going to really serve people and be impactful and transform your community. Thank you for sharing that. Mayor Burks, what would you like to add? Um, well, I also would like to say that it's important for you to be a servant leader and making sure that you're not using the position as a political resume. Um, because so often what happens is that you may have political aspirations, but those political aspirations don't meet the needs of the community. And so I think it is very important that if you decide to run, that number one, you are community focused, that you are involved and engaged in your community, that you always listen and have the pulse of your community, and that you make decisions that will benefit the best of your community. You will encounter people who may want to um, sidetrack you, but always use that uh, compass, that moral compass, um, that community compass to stay focused on what is the best interest of the community. I think it's, it's always important to have good leaders who are your mentors, who can provide you the guidance that you need, but always remember at the end of the day, you're the one who has to make that final decision, whether they give you whatever information or, or support that you need. 
make the good decisions based on what is in the best interest of the community, not as what's in the best interest for your future goals. So always think about how, when I am in this seat, I am going to do the best job for this city. And when I leave the seat, I have done my best and given my best. Making sure you also set some boundaries um, because it's, it's easy for you to get so wound up in doing what you do. But if you don't make sure that you replenish yourself and give yourself the energy, you won't be good to anyone. Um, always make sure, again, surrounding yourselves with good people who will tell you no when you need to hear no sometimes, you know, to make sure that they will be have your best interest and not say yes to you all the time. Um, when you need to hear that you might need to think things differently, you might need to involve other people, having those people who are close to you um, and, keep, and have a few people who are extremely close to you. Not everybody needs to know who they are kind of folks. Um, that is very critical to make sure that you have that because then they can help um, be your pulse sometimes and give you feedback that other people may not even give you so that you can do your job. But always do it with dignity, pride, um, and with um, empathy for your community. I think those are very important things for you to do. Right, that's right. And Mayor Motley Broom, what would you like to add to all of these important uh, tools and, and tips that, that mayors have offered? I think both mayors really summed it up very well. If you're thinking about running for office, though, you need a good team. And you need a good plan and you need to execute that plan. I would wholeheartedly agree with everything they've said, but if you're actually talking about nuts and bolts, you need to have a plan and you need to execute on the plan and stick to the plan and get a good team that's going to help you do that. There you go. There are a few tips uh, and words of advice for anybody. And I'm sure you can always reach out uh, if there are any more specific questions that you may have. Um, and this is to all the young people who may want to run for office one day and continue to follow these mayors, stay connected with their journeys, all the great work that they're doing in their communities. We really just want to thank you all again, Mayor Beverly Burks from Clarkston. We're going to give her a round of applause. Mayor Bianca Motley Broom from College Park, give her a round of applause. And Mayor Dina Holiday Ingram from East Point, round of applause. Thank you all so much for making this Women's Equality Day so special for y'all are all busy you all have families you all have all these obligations but you made time and we hope that those of you who all tuned in gained something from this conversation there was so much shared today and it'll live on uh, online forever so you can always go back and rewatch some of it uh, we want to thank you all for your time again mayor burks thank you for bringing us together for sharing your vision for planting the seed to have this conversation we are so grateful for all of your leadership and with that being said we come to the closing of our program and we want to just thank everybody for tuning in thank you for spending this women's equality day with us and to the panelists we thank you all again thank, thank you everybody you, and we want to make sure we thank you for being our moderator tonight and so thank you for doing an excellent job thank you yeah, awesome job thank you thank you it was an honor all right thank you everyone bye